Thank you. I think, Andre, I would like to ask you about, uh, do you have any more experience or what your experience with anaplastic large cell lymphoma has been? Thank you, Myron. So as you probably know, we started our journey on a plastic lymphoma from a registrational trial of brintoximab vidotin in relapsed refractory LCL. And uh, we have seen some remarkable responses early on in that study. And the study was actually very well accruing, probably the fastest accruing study because of that. And it was only natural to try it in the LCL because the expression of CD30 is so bright in this malignancy. And uh, there was probably no surprise that most of the patients uh, with relapsed refractory disease, some of them who failed autologous transplant, some of them had uh, resistance to multiple lines of therapy responded to this agent. And what was very interesting that in some of the patients' responses were very durable. Some of the patients were able to go to consolidative autologous transplant. And early on, we have seen a plateauing effect on progression-free survival, overall survival curves, and the recently updated um, uh, results of that study continue to show plateau in some patients. So I think it's something unique that we have in our hands with this agent that we haven't seen with other conventional agents, so we're very excited to see that. And I think this is probably a um, uh, most active uh, or the disease where the drug is most active, and we're very excited to have that. I guess one question that I would raise to you is that in individuals, that say um, have had say primary refractory disease or relapsing disease that um, are not actually candidates for auto transplant who receive brintuximab vidotin achieve a good remission response. I think the big question has been discussed around: Do you continue the brintuximab vidotin, or do you stop after you get the maximum response and take them to auto transplant? What would your feeling feeling be about that? Yeah, uh, I think that the question is still remains open, and we have experience either way. There are several patients on the study and patients that I have in my clinic panel that did receive consolidative transplant and doing quite well, some of them several years out from transplantation. But what's even more remarkable, some of the older patients that I have in their late 70s and early 80s who were not candidates or refused the consolidative high-dose therapy, they received up to 16 cycles, 12, 16 cycles on the study, and then discontinued treatment, whether by their will or due to toxicities, and now remain a long-term responders. And one of the patients I've seen a couple of weeks ago is almost two years out from treatment without ever receiving autologous transplant. So I, I think that we still don't have a solid answer whether this should be a maintenance drug, like say we do with rituxin, or there is a sufficient number of cycles. In my practice, I usually gauge this by toxicity and patient's quality of life and um, convenience. But uh, I don't think the answer is quite there yet, how long we should continue this in CR patients. Have you had any patients where you stop the patient, say for a drug holiday or toxicity, and then when they started relapsing, have you ever restarted and seen activity with the agent? I sure have. In fact, at our institution, we have conducted a retreatment study. It was investigated, initiated trial, and a couple of my patients went back on the brintoximab pedotin after relapse, and actually one of them went this, uh, with a third relapse back on the study, and they continued to respond to the agent if they had brintoximab-sensitive disease at the time, the discontinuation. So it's a very unique quality of the agent. It's very interesting. I was wondering, Lauren, if you could comment on patients receiving this agent in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Well, it's, it's also a very active agent there. So there's uh, phase two trials, uh, two of them, one from Stanford, one from MD Anderson, that shows very good activity, particularly in transform mycosis fungoides, which is a very difficult patient group to treat. And that's led to a phase three trial that's ongoing uh, with BV Doten um, uh, versus investigator's choice. But I think one thing that comes out of that, that data is that there was a specific look at the IHC staining um, mm -hmm. of the skin biopsies. And even though they're very heterogeneous, uh, you can see that there doesn't appear to be much correlation between IHC staining and response. So it opens up the question whether IHC staining is appropriately sensitive or is the appropriate test to know who the patients are that will benefit from treatment. Any uh, unique toxicities for the cutaneous T cell lymphoma patients? Well, some of my colleagues have noticed more neurotoxicity. Mm -hmm. um, and really, the phase three trial will make that much more clear. I was going to ask Steve, uh, what about other T cell uh, neoplasms? Yeah, so uh, in, the, in the same trial that, that Anas mentioned, there was, a, there was a, a, a broad phase two trial looking at other lymphomas with any CD30 expression, and the, and the criteria for that 
for entry was your patho pathologist had to see at least 1% CD30. So you had to have some CD30. In the T-cell subset, we did see responses uh, in non-ALCL patients, about a 50% response rate in angioaminoblastic T-cell lymphoma and less in peripheral T-cell lymphoma unspecified. So still reasonably good activity, not the same level that was seen in the anaplastic large cell lymphoma study where it was over 80% of patients responding. Kind of following up on what Lauren said and, and maybe the problems with, I, with IHC, is in some of the very low CD30 expressors, uh, no correlation with response. And a couple of those patients on central review, they couldn't really see CD30 expression, mm -hmm. suggesting that, that, that the IHC hasn't really been a good correlate. However, when we looked at soluble CD30 in serum, all those patients did have elevated levels of soluble CD30, suggesting that maybe those lymphomas aren't truly CD30 negative lymphomas, but they're not well detected by IHC. And I think that needs to be sorted out in, ter in terms of thinking about how broadly you could apply this drug outside of the, the indicated uses. I'm just curious, Steve, uh, with your experience in PTCL, when you have a patient that after initial therapy uh, that they say progress or they don't have a very good response, um, where do you implement, we're going to talk about uh, in, in saying exclu excluding a clinical trial, of course. So would you use it as second line, third line? Where do you use it in your practice? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little challenging right now because we primarily used it on clinical trial for these patient settings, so we haven't encountered that very much. You know, I think in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, it's on label and the, uh, the responses are an order of magnitude greater than what we see with the other agents. So I think that really would be incorporated as early as seems reasonable in those patients. I think with the other T cell lymphomas, the response rate kind of is more in line with what we've seen with some of the other improved agents like pralotrexate and romadepsin. Um, and not really knowing how the CD30 eligibility plays into that, I think it's, it's in the mix for those, but I can't say that it's, it clearly jumps to the front of the line, um, but it is in the mix for those patients.